Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, OnScript listeners. Welcome back for another episode. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Westminster Theological Center in the UK. I'm a co-host of OnScript with Matt Bates at Quincy University in Illinois and Drew Johnson at the King's College in NYC, though he's at St. Andrews for this year. Two quick announcements before we get on to the episode. First, October is National OnScript iTunes Review Month, in case you didn't know about that. Uh, That's just a fancy way of asking if you could give us a review on iTunes as a way to help others find us. Second, stay tuned until the end of the episode where we have a few more book recommendations, not from us, but from you, by the people and for the people. Okay, on to the episode. Anointing, christening, unction, Messiah, Christ. The simple act of pouring or smearing oil on the head has proven both foundational and divisive in Judaism and Christianity. This language about oil can be very, well, sorry to do this to you, but this language about oil can be very slippery. This is true in ancient contexts as well as modern. Disagreements about anointing and messianic terminology abound. For instance, Trypho, a 2nd century Jew, is reported to have said the following in his famous dialogue with Justin Martyr. The Messiah, if indeed he has come, and is somewhere, is incognito. He does not even know himself, nor does he have any power until Elijah comes and anoints him and makes him manifest to everyone. And then Trypho uh, speaks about the Christian community and says the following. He says, but you having accepted a vain report, are reinventing a Messiah for yourselves and are now perishing heedlessly on his account. This is Matthew Bates, your OnScript host, uh, speaking today from Quincy, Illinois, uh, where we are about to enjoy a very exciting eclipse in a number of hours here, but it's actually gray outside. Everyone's hoping the sun comes out. Uh, You listeners have probably already enjoyed the eclipse, uh, many of you at least, uh, as these are obviously pre-recorded. I'm I'm speaking today with Matthew Novenson. Uh, Matt uh, has probably thought about the meaning of Messiah language in the ancient world a little bit more than we have. Uh, just a little bit more, as uh, Matt's written two books on this now, but he has a new book out, The Grammar of Messianism, an Ancient Jewish Political Idiom and Its Users, published by Oxford University Press. Welcome to OnScript, Matt. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Yeah, now, this is your second book with Oxford, touching on uh, ancient sources of Messiah language, and you obviously must have more than a passing interest in this topic. <laughs> <laughs> so why? Uh, why has this topic in particular grabbed your attention? What got you interested in, in the topic, you know, when you were back in your grad school days, and, uh, and you know, the first book was your di- a product of your dissertation. Uh, so how did you even get hooked in this whole uh, landscape of Messianic discourse? Yeah, yeah. Um, good question. I suppose there's two things I'd say. One of them is uh, I, I came to the topic, uh, as I mentioned, from the angle of being interested in questions and understanding the letters of Paul, uh, where, as as you well know, and as lots of your uh, listeners will know, uh, lots of discussion of Paul, probably for reasons having to do with the, the Western theological heritage, uh, have focused on themes especially of you know what in, in theological terms have uh, would be called soteriology so the, the questions about justification uh, grace faith works uh, etc those kinds of themes were for a long time have been sort of the main the main event in Pauline studies uh, and lots of people had noted the from one angle that's a bit strange because Paul's actual talk of uh, righteousness, faith, and works occurs uh, in a relatively few targeted areas in a couple of epistles, and is just not at all in a number of epistles. Uh, and so I was kind of looking for a way into Pauline theology, a way into understanding what Paul was all about uh, that was not uh, was at least not, not beholden to certain received ways of thinking in just the way that that uh, I, I don't know. Lot, lots of studies are. I was looking for something, a different angle in, something a bit creative. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, the interesting thing about Paul is uh, 
while justification, faith, and works he may mention only you know here and there from time to time, Christ is on literally every page of the, the letters of Paul. And so I was I, I got interested in trying to understand Paul's thinking in general from the angle of Christology in particular. And uh, as you know, there was there's an old saw in uh, Pauline studies that uh, when Paul writes the word Christos, uh, we always translate it Christ, not Messiah, because according to the handbooks and theologies of Paul, for Paul it's a proper name, no longer a title. Uh, and so I came into that study sort of just questioning that that uh, received opinion and uh, ended up arguing against it in certain ways. Um, the other occasion for the my interest in the first book was, as often happens, maybe with lots of us, was a seminar, a, a course I took in graduate school um, on Jewish messianism in the ancient world. Uh, it was a seminar run by uh, Martha Himmelfarb and Peter Schaefer. We looked at uh, beginning in a few Hebrew Bible passages and then right up through late antiquity to uh, the, the the Babylonian Talmud and some of the Hebrew apocalypses, uh, like Sefer Zerubbabel, Sefer Eliyahu, and so I got a sort of crash course in this area of research, and uh, that sort of you know lit a fire for me, and 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 I went off down that path. I, I think for a lot of us, you're right, uh, the who have done doctoral training, it's certainly the seminars end up stimulating uh, you into an area of research you wouldn't have gone into. For me, I, I took a um, a seminar on patristic exegesis of the Psalter uh, with Brian Daly uh, and Gary Anderson. They, they, they team taught that as well. Um, and uh, for me, that it was sort of reading the early fathers, and I was asking questions about Paul that uh, you know that I wouldn't have asked otherwise, uh, because I was thinking to do dissertation on Paul, and, and you know you're kind of thinking about these questions. And for me, that sort of led into this whole prosopological exegesis. It's been very important for my own research. So I think you're right. It's uh, uh, it's certainly stimulating to be in those doctoral seminars, and, and that's very helpful. Now, into the book itself a, a little bit more, Matt, it seems fair to me to say that your book, if it's reacting against something, uh, it's probably the domination of the what we might call history of ideas approach uh, to the concept of Messiah. Uh, is that fair to say that that's what you're, you're really reacting against? And maybe can you explain the dominant model uh, of research uh, within our field about messianism that you're responding to? Yeah, certainly. The, so the book, you know, uh, positively, constructively, it, it tries to sketch an account of, of how one can fruitfully study ancient texts about Messiah figures and, and make sense of them, understand how they relate to one another, understand where they get their, um, their language and, and themes from, um, and so on. So that there, there's a, a positive account offered which has very much to do with uh, language and exegesis and interpretation of uh, Jewish sacred texts. Uh, but it is also a book that is very much in conversation with uh, the prior history of research. And in this case, the uh, messianism is one of these grand old themes in the field of biblical studies, uh, crossing lots of subfields. I mean, Hebrew Bible scholars, New Testament scholars, uh, scholars of the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Judaism and scholars of uh, the rabbis and the Talmuds. Uh, lots have written great big books on, on this topic where through the 19th and the first half of the 20th century or so, uh, the overwhelming rubric under which this was done was, uh, was the messianic idea. So there are uh, I mean, scores of important, big important books on the history of the messianic idea in Judaism. Uh, and sometimes Christianity as well. And that genre of book uh, emerged in a certain late 19th century context uh, where the history of ideas was uh, you know, the dominant way to talk about lots of topics uh, like this, and uh, where idea and this approach uh, we we should understand and, and I actually write it in the book with a uh, with a capital I uh, in a in a Hegelian sense as this thing that exists uh, above and uh, apart from human actors and authors and so on and that that imposes itself on on human history. So in the later 20th century and and on up to now, philosophically, lots of scholars have moved on from that way of thinking about uh, history and yet. 
the, the literature on messianism in in biblical studies broadly understood still uh, sort of channels a lot of that that spirit. So there have been um, some short suggestive studies by lots of really interesting scholars in the last generation or so. So people like uh, Lauren Stuckenbrook and John Collins uh, and Annette Reed uh, and so on, who's, who's I'd, who had suggested sort of a different way of thinking about this. And, uh, and so I was following up some of those nascent ideas saying, what, what if we could go back and look at a lot of these famous texts like Justin's Dialogue with Trypho, which you mentioned, uh, like the Psalms of Solomon, uh, like the Qumran Community Rule, like the Synoptic Gospels, uh, what if we could give an account of those and their understanding of messiahs without presupposing this sort of classical messianic idea uh, that, that we have reason to doubt on philosophical grounds? Can we understand these texts at the level of their, uh, their language and their interpretation of their own source texts and so on? Um, so that's the, the bottom lies, an, an attempt to look at a relatively familiar body of evidence uh, but sketch a, a, a different angle of approach to it. And that's helpful. And so um, your counter proposal then is to, to that we should think more about uh, the grammar of how the language goes uh, than the history of ideas approach. It, I was going to read a, a, a statement here that you make on page 14 of your book as it, it'll give listeners a chance to see the flavor of your writing a little bit. But also this was obviously one of your key thesis statements. Uh, let, me, let me read it as follows. Although one might not know it from the modern history of research, what we call messy Messianism is most basically a way of talking about the world, a set of linguistic resources, and equally important, linguistic constraints inherited from the Jewish scriptures. Ancient Jewish and Christian texts about messiahs, from 2nd Isaiah to the Talmud Bavli, and at myriad points in between, are participants in one great ancient Mediterranean language game. Uh, and this uh, this uh, language game discourse that you pick up then, uh, obviously uh, from Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, maybe we can talk about that in a second. As different as these texts are, continuing uh, with your with with you on page fourteen, as different as these texts are from one another in many other respects, they are all involved in negotiating a common set of social realities by using a common set of scriptural source texts to solve a common set of interpretive puzzles which are themselves generated by the same scriptural source texts. And here I thought this was maybe your key statement. If messianism is a language game, then what I am calling, quote, the grammar of messianism uh, is the rules of the game, the way Messiah language worked for the ancient authors who chose to use it, the discursive possibilities it opened up, as well as the discursive constraints it entailed. Um, so uh, you obviously are, are drawing this language game um, uh, uh, discourse uh, from uh, Wittgenstein and are, are trying to, uh, to to make a point about a, a different way forward. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on your methodology here and uh, and and what you're what you're doing with this thesis? Yeah, uh, I mean, language game theory and Wittgenstein has of course uh, had a, a really prolific afterlife in all kinds of disciplines in the humanities. Uh, as much in religious studies and theology as anywhere else. Uh, in this particular subfield that I'm working in, even the application of Wittgenstein to this problem I pick up from uh, from Nils Dahl, great uh, Norwegian New Testament scholar who was at Yale for many years. Uh, but he worked a lot on New Testament Christology and then also on uh, the Qumran texts. And he made this connection, oh, back in the 1970s or something. He'd said that uh, New Testament scholars have this habit of talking about Christology in New Testament scholars favor the metaphor of uh, uh, rivers when talking about Christology, that there's streams of water flowing into one another. Uh, and we don't explicate that metaphor, we just sort of assume it. Uh, and this, I think this is true, especially if you go back and read kind of classic Christology books from the 50s, 60s, 70s. You do get lots of uh, fluminous language, lots of rivers and streams and so on. Uh, and Dahl said, why do we assume that metaphor? That's, that seems sort of arbitrary. Uh, and it also then tempts us to think along certain lines that would be in, entailed by uh, a, a, a river metaphor. Uh, you know, that it moves in one direction, that uh, certain smaller streams lead into a big one, and thereafter they join up, and they're sort of one big thing. And he said, well, none of those necessarily follow. They're just implied by the metaphor. He'd suggested that, that uh, you know, back when it was a bit more novel to do so, that Wittgenstein was... Uh, really helpful here, and that what the early Christians are doing with 
Christological claim, claims about Jesus, uh, are sort of structurally similar, he was suggesting, to uh, a number of the Qumran texts about various eschatological heroes in, in, in their scenarios, uh, the messiahs of Aaron and Israel and the, the one who rises to teach the law at the end of days and so on. Uh, he said, uh, he suggested that it would be helpful if we think of them as playing a similar sort of game to what earliest Christian writers were doing when, when uh, writing about Jesus. And that is, they're, they're interpreting figures who are really important to them, sort of triangulating a, a larger than life figure with uh, scriptural language, language that they assume they need to use to talk about something significant, and then also with their own uh, sort of empirical life circumstances. Uh, and that suggestion seems to me profoundly right, and then and also then uh, seems to have lots of important entailments, uh, knock-on effects, if you follow that idea through. So that's basically what I tried to do uh, in the book, is I'm looking at uh, the texts we have, looking at it as a kind of uh, scribal enterprise. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that case, right, the evidence is all uh, uh, language. Uh, it's all words, and uh, and especially this this body of text shares in common the word Messiah. I mean, that's the key the key thing for the way I get into it. But then also, it turns out lots of other common uh, ideas and sources that they're using. And so uh, I, I try to follow through the hypothesis that uh, they are playing a kind of game. It's often a deadly serious game, but it's a game in the sense that uh, they're 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 talking about something inherited from their source texts and traditions such that even if you know these these texts say the synoptic gospels and the Qumran community rule they're not talking directly to one another uh, but they actually are operating on a lot of similar assumptions and so by trying to explicate what those assumptions are that's uh, that's what I mean by spelling out these rules of the game yeah that's helpful and I I think that um, one way that this can um can be illustrated is to, to look at your page 15. I think I, I really loved how you, you moved to a practical example of the way in which um, exegetical discourse about the Old Testament becomes a language game in our later sources. Uh, you, uh, the game is on the one hand very playful, as, as I think that you acknowledge, but on the other hand, there's something more serious going on. Uh, and I'll read a little bit of this one. This is from the, um, the, uh, the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, this was just an example that you used that I thought uh, really... Um, helped uh, unfold your ideas uh, and here it goes what is what is his the messiah's name uh, the school of uh, rabbi Sheila said his name is shiloh for it is written until shiloh comes citing genesis 49 uh, the school of rabbi yanai said his name is yenin uh, for it is written his name shall endure forever ere the sun was his name is yenin citing psalm 72 the school of rabbi H- uh, hanina maintained his name is hanina uh, as it is written where will i not give you hanina uh, citing Jeremiah 16. Others say his name is Menahem ben Hezekiah, for it is written, For Menahem, who would relieve my soul as far, citing Lamentations. And then the rabbi said his name is the leper sculler. And this this one is actually particularly interesting uh, because of the Isaiah 53 connection. Uh, as it is written, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we regarded him as a leper, smitten by God and afflicted, citing Isaiah 53, 4. Now, um, the way in which this is a language game, then, um, uh, for uh, the rabbis that are involved in this discourse, uh, there's a couple ways that's happening. Uh, what's going on there uh, that makes this a game of sorts? Yeah, uh, so I said this. It's a, it's a very clever little piece because if you uh, if you look at it carefully, uh, I mean, at one level, that passage is doing something relatively familiar uh, to us in ancient Jewish and Christian texts, which is you know citing an opinion and then and then um, citing a, a scriptural source text that supposedly endorses that so you know here the question being entertained is what is the name of the messiah um you know the various rabbis the parties to this discussion make a suggestion and then they point to a uh, a scriptural source text that has the name in question most of which in these scriptural source texts they're not just any scriptures they're scriptures that again in this bigger network of uh of text, you know what I'm calling this this ancient language game about uh, about Messiah figures. Uh, they're particular oracles that one could cite, and you know at least expected expect to be uh, understood or vindicated in choosing that text in particular, right? Um, so Genesis 49 is from the, the the deathbed testament of Jacob. Psalm 72 is a classic, uh, you know, 
the so-called royal mm-hmm. or, or messianic psalm. So they're not they're they're cleverly chosen. But then there's you know in this text there's this double layer of of uh, playfulness in it, in that each of the names suggested also closely corresponds to the name of the rabbi who's the head of each school that's suggesting it, right? So yeah. the school of Rabbi Shilah says his name is Shiloh. Uh, the school of Rabbi Yanai says his name is Yanon, uh, and so on. So uh, it's just a, it's a very clever piece of exegesis uh, that's you know working in this uh, this particular uh, field, this language game about uh, messiahs in particular. Um, and that uh, I suggest that text, which is a great example, uh, I suggest is not so different from a text which would be maybe more familiar to. Uh, lots of your listeners, you know, the famous question about the son of David in the Synoptic Gospels, you know, where in the Mark 12 version, uh, Jesus says, how can the scribes say the Messiah is the son of David? David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Psalm, citing Psalm 110. David himself calls the Messiah Lord, so how is he his son? Structurally, there's something really similar going on there, right? Uh, they're discussing, you know, a certain... Uh, claim, a contestable claim about the identity of the Messiah. In this case, it's not his name, but his, but his father's name. Uh, and then there's a very clever appeal to a certain, a certain scripture which kind of confounds the expectations of the other party in the, in the discussion. But there, too, the, the scriptural source uh, that he cites, uh, Psalm 110, is at least, uh, you know, has, has underlying connections to this network of, of source texts that are often gone to. Uh, and that again is off, it's associated with the royal house of David. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're right in, in, in highlighting that. That's that, that uh, the text from Bavli Sanhedrin uh, well illustrates the kind of thing that I'm uh, that I'm looking at. Um, and if you take those examples, which admittedly are you know a little bit more playful than than lots of others, nevertheless the dynamic they're demonstrating, I end up arguing is very similar to uh, what's going on in, in, in lots of other uh, Messiah texts that we don't normally, you know, uh, regard as as, uh, as playing a game in that way. Um, now, as I worked through your book, which I really enjoyed, um, I was kind of, there was a question I was hoping that you were going to answer that your thesis raised for me uh, that I didn't really answer. And I, I'm, I'm curious to press you on a little bit now uh, while I have the chance. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's this, if we, if we accept your thesis, you know, that messianic discourse is best thought of as a language game, then how do we decide who's won the game? Uh, the kind of question of normative claims here uh, that that flows from your your, your project. Now, you, of course, you don't have to answer that. You can sort of, you know, just describe uh, the nature of the game, and that's a, a perfectly acceptable enterprise. And that's where you chose to draw the boundaries. But of course, uh, many of us want to go beyond that and say, but um, but there's more than a game, right? Because there's a, a certain referential cl- truth claims that are being made uh, as this game is being played, right? And um, uh, what's most at stake for uh, religious communities, both ancient and modern, is um, the legitimacy of the game and the legitimacy of the, the whole enterprise uh, in terms of uh, who's best using this Messiah language and, and the truth value of all that. So how do we decide um, who wins the game? Uh, can we decide that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. I, do, I certainly don't answer that question. And I don't, I don't, I wouldn't take the view that it's easily answerable. Uh, other than uh, sort of from inside a particular religious community, um, this issue does famously illustrate that dynamic, the, the, the dynamic that uh, you know, religious truth claims are held to be true relative to a whole network of other beliefs, you know, usually shared by the co-religionists, by, by uh, insiders, and that you know, hopefully could be understood by outsiders, but that... Uh, you know, aren't always aren't are not conceded to be correct by all parties in the discussion. Um, mm-hmm. I do. I mean, I treat this issue a bit at the uh, near the end of the chapter uh, on the so-called Jewish Messiah Christian Messiah distinction, the end of chapter six, because mm-hmm. this is a really good uh, example of this, right? Where um, already in ancient Jewish Christian uh, Polemics, which we get mostly just from the Christian side in the sort of contra Judaeus tradition, like Justin's dialogue with Trifo. Already there, we have this, we encounter counterclaims between Jews and Christians uh, 
uh, where they both are perceiving, you know, the rather different way that the one religious sect is, is quote unquote, playing this game uh, differently from the other. And yet they disagree with one another on the, well, on who's right. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the Justin and Trifo example you cited at the beginning, Justin heaps up scriptures in support of his claims about Jesus. And Trifo says, in effect, yeah, I see what you did there, (laughs) but you're just not right. (laughs) Right. Uh You, you've misinterpreted those scriptures. So, and, and in that one passage, Trifo says, you have, it's, I think it's Anaplasa. You've, you've reinvented, you've remade for yourself a Messiah. You've, uh, in the sense that you're not, you want to say Jesus is the Messiah, but I don't think that word means what you think it means. Uh, you've, you know, you, you, you've recoined it to mean something different. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the way down to modern literature, indeed contemporary scholarly literature on this, one finds uh, very much the same kinds of claims made by both Jewish and Christian scholars who've written on this uh, issue. And what's interesting is that uh, they'll tend to, to both uh, acknowledge the basic contours of what the two religious traditions broadly conceived have understood by the term Messiah. Uh, in other words, they'll the broadly agree what Jews mean by it and what Christians mean by it, but then they'll, <laughs> each side congratulates itself that it has the better account of it, right? So the mm-hmm. the the famous instance of this is the a version of the, uh, the old Christian claim that um, Christians understand Messiah in a sort of uh, spiritualized or internalized sense where the Messiah came, but rather than, uh, you know, crush the Romans uh, under his heel and make the world new again. Instead, what he did was come and, uh, you know, died so as to forgive sins uh, and and so on. To which uh, some Jewish critics, all the way back to, you know, Trifo as Justin portrays him, and then down to modern giant Jewish thinkers like Martin Buber famously uh, said in, in a number of places, you know, look at the world around you. Uh, I, I take seriously the Christians claim that Jesus is the Messiah, but uh, if the world spins on as it ever has and sin is still rampant in the world, then clearly he wasn't, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. well-intentioned in that belief, but they're just mistaken, uh, empirically mistaken, right? Where, uh, mm-hmm. and so he said, you can call that a Messiah, but from Buber's own Jewish perspective, he'd say that's just not worth calling a Messiah because he didn't make the world new again. Um, whereas... Christian uh, interpreters have tended to to say, yes, that is what we mean by Messiah, but then to valorize it and say that's actually a better version of what a Messiah should be. So in the academic literature, the great uh, Hebrew Bible scholar Sigmund Movinkel, uh, he says this at the end of his big book on Messianism uh, called He That Cometh. He says that Jesus uh, purges and purifies and raises to a higher plane the concept of the Messiah by redefining it, right? So they they're acknowledging a sort of rather different move uh, that this other religious community makes, and then they just disagree on, you know, whose is more praiseworthy. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't think the question, I mean, perhaps, uh, you know, this language game is not the kind that can be won. It's not like chess or something like that. Or it's it's the kind of thing that can only be declared won, you know, by insiders to a particular religious tradition. Uh-huh. Yeah, I wonder if, um, you know, sort of the, the way in which your um, project sort of borrows uh, from Wittgenstein, um, you know, which he's obviously famous for, uh, his, his language game, uh, uh, philosophical insights. And, and as part of that, you know, it's sort of that um, thing, uh, language refers just to other language, right? You kind of end up having signifiers referring to signifiers referring to signifiers. And there's not really a grounding then uh, or a concrete contact with, uh, with reality or with truth in any any kind of way, and so he's oftentimes associated with like coherence models then of epistemology or how we know what's true, and uh, maybe this uh, uh, this the answer to this has to do with correspondence models of truth uh, that um, that as Christians and Jewish communities evaluate. Uh, the the truth claims here that uh, they're uh, in order to try to to to, to land them, right? You have to kind of move to a correspondence model and say, how well does uh, uh, this game correspond to reality as we know it, uh, where Wittgenstein doesn't want to go there, and your project, in a sense, doesn't uh, doesn't need to or want to go there either. Uh, but I appreciate your, your kind of speculation beyond uh, the bounds of your project uh, proper uh, to give us uh, some insight into how uh, you might answer that. Well, let's change the pace, Matt, here, and uh, and go to a speed round. Uh, and uh, and uh, so the, ga- the game 
game here, uh, the language game, is that you don't get nearly <laughs> as much time to answer. Uh, yeah. So, you know, previously I've given you, you know, you got a couple minutes to respond. Here you just tell me your answer, but you don't really get to justify it. Uh, so um, we're looking for, you know, 10, 15, 20 second answers. Okay. Uh, so you ready? Yeah. Okay. So what's a trend in society that scares you? Oh, goodness. Um, various versions internationally now, I'm aware, living in the UK and, and coming from the US, various particular manifestations of nationalism uh, in our current age have me a bit nervous. You walk up to the bartender and you order what? Uh, a uh, brew dog, punk IPA. Okay. IPA, huh? Uh, what's the most important theology or biblical studies book of the last 50 years? Now, that's a tough one. Most oh. important theology or biblical studies. You choose either one. The last 50 years. It's too big. Too big to name just one. Re yeah. Relative to the, 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 area, the areas I run in, I would say Sanders, Paul, and Palestinian Judaism. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that question I might have to take off my list of my speed round. I don't know that anybody has been able to successfully answer that. It, it is. I don't know what I would answer. That's it's it is too big and too hard. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's something you find embarrassing? Uh, a few typos that I've discovered in in the the published uh, edition of my book. <laughs> I've only I've only seen two, but one was Hebrew backwards, uh, as that was probably uh, that was probably your editor. Uh, uh, yeah. They didn't couldn't read Hebrew. Uh, the the other uh, I did find one typo. I'll tell you about it later. All right, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, do you believe in ghosts? Uh, no, no. All right, all right. That's the end of speed round one. I got another <laughs> speed round for you later. You did well. All right. Um, <laughs> All right, yeah, so uh, actually most of what we've talked about so far has to do with your introduction and framing of your whole project, and we haven't uh, really gotten down into the weeds of your subsequent chapters, which are all uh, kind of focused on different problems, especially as those were manifest in the history of scholarship, uh, and uh, your, your proposal for a more grammar approach and how that might be a way forward. So your third chapter then uh, pertains to how ancestry and merit function in ancient Messiah discourse. Um, and uh, namely, I guess if we were going to kind of get down to brass tacks, um, to be a Messiah in general was necessary to be born into the right family, perhaps, but that might be negotiable uh, if, in fact, you've had a number of spectacular achievements. So there's sort of a, you know, a, an interplay between those two criteria. On the one hand, uh, the right lineage being important. On the other hand, um, maybe if you've done something marvelous, uh, that you could be the Messiah nonetheless. Um, can you give an ancient example or two, apart from Jesus, uh, who's probably well, Jesus is pretty sufficiently well known to probably most of our listeners that they might be interested in some beyond Jesus, where we see this kind of dynamic at work of, on the one hand, ancestry, but on the other hand, just doing really nifty stuff uh, <laughs> that could qualify you to be a messiah? Yeah. Uh, so this issue comes up in the in the scholarly literature, uh, you know, around a number of particular historical figures. Jesus is one of them. Um, and actually, I mean, a side note, this goes back to your, your previous uh, comments about Wittgenstein and the question of, you know, the, the correspondence of language to, uh, to the world around us. Uh, because one of the points I make in the book and in this chapter especially is that, uh, I mean, yes, most of what I'm describing is a language game in the sense of, you know, texts working with, playing with previous texts and terms and so on. But... Uh, almost always they're doing so in uh, I mean it's almost they, they always are doing it and it's almost always recognizable you can you can sometimes see how they're 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 doing this uh, in conversation with their own empirical circumstances uh, and that's this particular chapter is one really strong example of that that you know if you're an ancient writer an ancient partisan to this or that sect and you want to claim that so and so uh, is the messiah what are the criteria by which you can say that and and get away with it, right? And and make a and make a, a, a plausible claim to that effect. So, um, I mean, this is discussed around the case of Jesus in particular, who is by far the earliest layers of tradition want to say that Jesus came from the family of David. But there are a few snippets even in the New Testament that don't seem to 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 know or bear that out which uh, the Gospel of John most most significantly, that has raised the question, sort of how did how did the title Messiah first get attached to Jesus? Was it because he was born of the right family first, or was it because he was known to have done certain remarkable things? And, uh, right, it's a kind of chicken and egg question. It's a bit difficult in the case of Jesus, even where there is lots of relatively early testimony about the family he came from, 
it's more of a problem with some other figures. And in this chapter, I discuss quite a number of them. I mean, I don't know, eight or ten. Um, two, who, whose names at least will be known and some of whose stories will be known maybe to, to many of your listeners, um, where there's a lot of discussion around this. Uh, I mean, one is Judah Maccabee or Judas Maccabeus, you know, the first uh, hero of the Hasmonean uh, family, the hero of the, uh, the Jewish revolt against the Seleucids in the second century BCE. There's a lot of discussion in, this, in the, the modern scholarly literature about whether Judas Maccabeus should, should be called a messiah, because in, in no ancient sources is he ever called one. And yet, he would sort of seem to fit uh, the model that, that we sort of received of what a, what a messiah would look like, right? Like a sort of conquering hero who um, purifies Jerusalem and, and, and throws out the, uh, the, the pagan hordes and so on. And yet, uh, the sources don't call him a messiah. And so there's lots of sort of worrying about this question, why, in the, uh, the scholarly literature. And, and this is one of the... Uh, one of the reasons I became discontent with and, and started trying to think my way through the messianic idea hypothesis is uh, I, I, in that chapter I discuss these two uh, early 20th century scholars who say uh, second century BC writers don't call Judah Maccabee Messiah because one scholar will say the messianic idea uh, had had waned it had it had ebbed low and uh, so the people in that day were not uh, uh, sort of animated by the messianic idea. Otherwise, if they had been, they would have. We would have messianic texts written about uh, Judah Maccabee. Whereas another contemporary scholar working on this says, no, the fact that Judah Maccabee is not called Messiah is direct evidence of the vigor of the messianic idea in this period in history, because mm -hmm. the messianic idea prescribes that the Messiah be a son of David. Judah Maccabee is a priest. Uh, so a Levite by tribe and not a son of David, therefore he can't be the Messiah. Therefore, the fact that he's not called one is evidence, ironically, kind of, of how powerful the pure form of the Messianic idea was at this point in history, <laughs> which is really interesting, right? Uh, yeah, it shows yeah. you how evidence never interprets itself. So Judah Maccabee is one example. Another really significant one is uh, Shimon Bar Kokhba or Bar Kokhba. The the, yeah. uh, the leader of the second Jewish Roman revolt in the second century. That's probably, that's probably my favorite example. I yeah. Yeah. So he. I mean. So he's an example where. Uh, I mean. Un, you know. Judah Maccabee. The, the the Hasmoneans threw off the Seleucids, and there was you know more or less a century of quasi independence uh, in the land of Israel. Bar Kokhba, uh, you know, had this remarkable run against the Romans under the reign of Hadrian in the 130s, but he and his forces are in the end destroyed and nothing comes of it. And in fact, uh, Hadrian then, uh, you know, raises Jerusalem or, uh, and, and, and establishes a Roman city and Roman cult there and so on. It's a very dark day for the Jews in the land of Israel. Um, but so Bar Kokhba, though, in, in the stories is regarded as, you know, as the hero of that war and is, uh, there's lots of texts about him being the Messiah from the Talmud and Midrash, which are later than mm -hmm. the war, uh, where the you know the tradents of those stories do not believe he is in fact the Messiah because they live you know centuries later and and mm -hmm. uh, it's clear that he wasn't. But then there is this ex post facto rationalizing of why he was thought to be the Messiah, and so the question of ancestry comes up because in ancient sources uh, there's not a hint uh, that Bar Kokhba had or even claimed to be a Davidide you know, from from the house of David. And yet, apparently, there was, uh, you know, there was no small opinion about him that he was the Messiah. So, and there's some uh, rabbinic text to this effect that the reason why he was uh, called Messiah was because of his mighty deeds. So, ironically, though, in the in the in the high Middle Ages, you finally get, for the first time, the proposal that Bar Kokhba must have been a Davidide because Rabbi Akiva thought he was the Messiah, and Rabbi mm -hmm. Akiva wouldn't make that mistake, so he must have been a Davidide. But that's, you know, more than a thousand years later that that idea uh, comes in. But it comes in because of this this tension, this dynamic uh, in the sources. And in the chapter, what I argue is this actually goes right back to the story of David in uh, Samuel Kings, because if you think about it, he's, he perfectly encapsulates this. David is, of course, you know, his name becomes the, the, the foremost brand of a blue blood dynasty, right? The house of David, mm -hmm. the line of David. And yet, in the story of the rise of David, he is David himself is not a legitimate successor to 
uh, to the throne, other than by you know divine choice. But in fact, David uh, supplants the house of Saul, so he's a he's an interloper. Uh, you know, a, a, to to outside observers, this is how it how it looks. And uh, so, if 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 you think about it that way, the story of David actually could, and and I argue was used to justify messianic claimants of both kinds ones who did come from the right family, or at least had a plausible claim to have come from the right family, and those who didn't. Uh, because either way, you could claim David as a, as a, uh, as a model and a forebear. Yeah, I, I, think that, uh, I think that the link that you make to David in the end was very insightful to me and helpful. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, uh, Barco Siba is particularly an interesting one because you have on the one hand the scriptural you know, play on the Numbers 24 passage, you know, the, the star goes forth from Jacob and so on and so forth, um, where you can connect his name to that. Um, and so you have on the one hand the exegetical component, but then on the other hand, like you said, there's the sort of later rationalizing backwards and thinking about his mighty deeds. Obviously, he'd led uh, this revolt against the Romans that proved unsuccessful. And uh, the, it, uh, I like the part uh, uh, where you brought up the passages that later that talk about uh, the Messiah uh, being able to smell and judge. And uh, and, uh, and that perhaps they had tested whether or not Bar Kosiba had a, a specially heightened sense of smell and had determined that because he hadn't had it, uh, he couldn't have been the Messiah, and therefore they had put him to death uh, as he had not demonstrated that kind of mighty deed of a heightened sense of smell. Uh, so th there's all kinds of delightful play uh, in some of these texts as uh, these things are these two poles are negotiated, right, of on the one hand uh, having the right, uh, the, the right lineage, on the other hand, having uh, the right kind of mighty deeds qualifications uh, as those two are under negotiation. So, yeah, that, that's, that's great stuff. Um, yeah, and so um, one of the um, uh, other chapters that you sort of um, uh, work with here, another category is uh, what we call, the, uh, or what you call and others have called the messianic vacuum hypothesis, the idea that uh, there was, uh, you know, a period of time where um, uh, uh, there was sort of this messianic vacuum uh, and uh, and looking for the right cast to fill it. Um, and uh, and so, um, you know, there's a famous silence in our sources about the Messiah. Uh, we would maybe uh, point to Josephus here uh, and some others uh, where we have um, various figures that could be Messiah or perhaps could have been uh, described as Messiah that aren't. Um, one of my favorites here, um, you, you mentioned, I think, in passing, I don't know if you cited the text in full, but um, we have, uh, for instance, the, the Egyptian false prophet that's mentioned uh, and is up to some interesting things. Mm -hmm. And I just was going to bring an excerpt forward here, and, uh, and, and let's see if we can talk about it together. Yeah. Uh, so I want you to think about some of the things that you see this guy, guy doing that seem like they're messianic. Uh, but on the other hand, why is he not identified as a messiah in our sources? Um, so here then... Um, this is uh, uh, from uh, uh, Josephus, his Antiquities, Book 20, uh, and this is in reference to the Egyptian, who's called an Egyptian false prophet in a parallel passage in the war, uh, but hear this from the Antiquities. At this time, a certain man from Egypt arrived at Jerusalem, saying he was a prophet and advising the mass of the common people to go with him to the Mount of Olives. Uh, which is just opposite the city. That's kind of a suggestive location, is it not, the Mount of Olives? Uh, and he said that from there he wanted to show them that at his command the walls of Jerusalem would fall down and they could make an entry into the city. But when Felix learned of these things, he commanded his soldiers to take up their weapons. Marching from Jerusalem with many horsemen and foot soldiers, he, meaning Felix, attacked, uh, attacked uh, the Egyptian and his followers, uh, killed 400 of them and took 200 alive. The Egyptian himself fled the battle and vanished without a trace. Um, so, uh, what is this Egyptian prophet up to uh, that seems like he could have perhaps been labeled as a messiah? Uh, and then why do you think he isn't? Yeah, um, it's an excellent question. Uh, much discussed by lots of uh, scholars who've written on Josephus, of course. Um, so, I take the view... Well, there are kind of two issues here. One is why jo Josephus curiously, ironically, might say, doesn't call anyone a Messiah except possibly Jesus, uh, which is a famous uh -huh. puzzle because Josephus, yeah. um, moderns think Josephus was not Christian. Um, and yet the only person in all his massive uh, corpus of work that he calls him a, a Christos is Jesus himself. Um, he calls him Legomenos Christos, so, you know, one mm -hmm. called Messiah. But um, but then there are lots of figures whom uh, 
scholars, when constructing a history of Messianism, have said, oh, that's a dead ringer for a messiah, and yet Josephus doesn't call him one, right? And so mm -hmm, this is one. Mm -hmm. uh, I take the view uh, on, on the bigger picture why Josephus names a number of figures whom scholars would call you know, messiahs or would-be messiahs. Uh, the older scholars called them pseudo-messiahs. Uh, but Josephus doesn't say so. Uh, there have been lots of theories that whether Josephus is whether Josephus was actually completely ignorant of apocalyptic strands of Judaism. This is what Arnaldo Momigliano uh, thought, or whether he is sort of writing in coded language because he knows he's, his Roman patrons are reading what he's writing. But yeah, that he's being he's being coy or even coded in a kind of post-colonial situation. Um, I take the view that. Uh, neither of those is right, but that he's actually translating. The reason Josephus doesn't use lots of words that we consider, well, that we know from, from lots of Greek Jewish literature is because he is, he's translating for a Greek speaking Roman audience. Um, so I use the analogy that, you know, writing for Romans, he says, now we have this group called the Pharisees. And as far as you're concerned, they're basically like Stoics, right? So mm -hmm. he, Josephus mm -hmm. calls the, the so-called sects in Judaism, he calls them philosophies. And he says, if you want to know the Pharisees, they're basically our Stoics. So I, I argue that uh, there are people who probably, if we could have interviewed their own partisans during the Jewish-Roman War, would have called their heroes, uh, you know, who would have been called messiahs. But then as much as Josephus is our only source, and he doesn't consider them messiahs, um, you know, we just can't know. But what he calls them is bandits, lestai, mm -hmm. or tyrants, mm -hmm. tyrannoi. And then I so some some scholars would would group the uh, the Egyptian false prophets under that rubric. I actually think there's a distinction that Josephus does actually quite carefully distinguish among several different types, because I think with just one or maybe two exceptions, he never calls the same person uh, both a bandit and a false prophet. So and here I'm, there's an interesting book by Rebecca Gray on this. Um, called prophetic figures in late second temple uh, jewish palestine where and, and she suggested this i think it's right that josephus uh there, there are people who like the egyptian who are what we might what scholars often call signs prophets that mm -hmm. this egyptian he's not he's not militant um but he is leading a movement and he you know uh takes the prerogative to declare that the sky is going to open and god will send uh, uh send victory down there are yeah. then other people who are you know, maybe no less religiously minded or motivated, but who also, you know, have soldiers and arms. And those are the people Josephus calls bandits and tyrants mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. And uh, th those are closer, I think, to um, what we more frequently see called Christoi or Messiahs in, in ancient texts. Um, hmm. The slippage occurs, well, the slippage is there a bit in the sources, but I think the slippage really comes in um, in modern discussion because of the the enormous impact, obviously, of, of Jesus on the whole history of our understanding of ancient Judaism and Christianity, so that Jesus, of course, is, becomes the Messiah in almost all early Christian literature, but he also was called a prophet, and he also did, you know, he worked mighty deeds and wondrous signs, and so, therefore, it's, it's easy for us to sort of elide those categories, but I think Josephus is actually pretty distinct uh, about hmm. them, so... Yeah, that's helpful. And, uh, you know, in this particular example of the Egyptian false prophet, one of the things that seems like it's noteworthy in light of your point, you know, is that it's the common people, not soldiers that go out with him to the Mount of Olives, you know, and that he wants to perform a mighty sign that seems like it wants to use you know, a reenactment of Jericho, you know, that at his command, the walls of Jericho are going to of Jerusalem are going to fall down and that he sort of positioned Jerusalem as, as Jericho, uh, which is interesting when you kind of think of the holy city and that, you know, Jer Jericho is sort of an ancient pagan city, you know, and that he's equating the two, what that might mean, you know, for what he thinks is going on in Jerusalem or what kind of statement he might be making about Jerusalem. But it is interesting that he's, he doesn't lead a band of soldiers so that you're right. Maybe that it, uh, Josephus, uh, even in his translation project, uh, you know, might not have in his own mind identified him as a Christos, uh, or a, a tyrannos, uh, but rather uh, as a false prophet for that reason. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, well, um, I have a, a number of other questions uh, that we could ask. We could undoubtedly talk forever, but we've been going for quite some time here. So let's do our second speed round, and then I have a, cu a, a couple final questions for you uh, about the book. So you ready for you ready for a second speed round? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, so you're locked in a gymnasium for 24 hours with 24 teenagers. How are you going to entertain them? Uh, uh, oh, let's see. We'd have a round-robin basketball tournament. Basketball. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, that, that's actually, I think, what my last guest was going to do as well. Uh, right. So basketball's in with teenagers. I got you. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> All right. Uh, are you willing to sing a song for me right now on the spot? Uh, no. <laughs> I've only had one person do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, the scariest thing about growing older is? Ooh. My children seem to be uh, rapidly becoming smarter than I am. Uh yeah, it is amazing watching them grow up. I have I have six children, and uh, my oldest is twelve. And uh, uh, yeah, it is it is it is quite remarkable. Uh, <laughs> life just flies by. It's true. I was actually reflecting on you know as as I was getting ready to interview you, I, I was like you know um, you know thinking about when did I meet you, and I was thinking it was, actually it was almost twelve years ago that I met you. Yeah. Uh, you know, not that we see not that we see each other very often. It's more like we bump into each other at a conference. Yeah. You know, and I uh, grab a half hour conversation here or there, but but that was kind of astonishing. Me, to me to think like well wow, that was 12 years ago yeah, that's right uh, or maybe more at this point actually so something something like that um yeah all right but all right uh so uh, next question if you were offered a free space flight to the moon and back would you take it Ooh. Uh, i'm not sure what the uh what the safety protocols for that are like now but i'm, I'm inclined <laughs> to say yes yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's obviously going to have some risk, here, right? Uh, yeah. You know, we're going to say it's you know maybe one in twenty you're going to die. Uh, so okay. Well, you're, you're you're willing to take your chances. Right. Now, when you get up there, are you going to moonwalk? You know, backward like Michael Jackson on the moon, uh, or uh, what are you going to do when you're I up there? I think you'd have to probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right. So if you're at my house for dinner, what's the one thing you're hoping I don't serve you? Ooh. Uh, eggplant. Eggplant. Mm. I yeah I, I, eggplant parmesan that's not bad no it's not bad but it's what I would hope you wouldn't yeah. be serving <laughs> all right if you were to complete a PhD in a field outside of theology history or religion what would the field be Ooh. um music music okay and is this do you have uh, musical inclinations yourself in the sense that you like to play or sing. Now, I don't know. I'm not going to believe you if you say you like to sing because you wouldn't sing for me already. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, not singing But in so music, much. music theory, music theory, or do you play instruments or what? Yeah, I, I play a couple of instruments, only very amateur. But uh, but yes, it's a uh, it's something I enjoy a lot outside my uh, professional field of competence. So what do you play? Uh, I play mandolin and guitar and a bit of banjo. Ah. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could do those things, but I, I have no musical ability. Well, that's cool. Um, all right, well, back back to your book here. A uh, couple wrap ups. Um, now, all projects have to have a reasonable limit, um, and you, uh, in 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 your project, opted not to deal with the historical Jesus very much. I mean, you 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 stick more at gospel level portrayal. Um, and here I'm just. This is again just a question I'm curious about, like. What if you would have probed questions of the historical Jesus? What do you th- like? What do you think that would have added to your project, or do you think it would have changed your results in any way? If instead of just saying that there's discourse about Jesus or certain por- portrayals, uh, to kind of probe into his own messianic understanding, uh, what do you think you you might have found out if you did? Do you think it would have added? Oh man, yeah. Uh, so I do a bit. I, I mean, I actually. Uh, as I mentioned before, with the cases of uh, Judah Maccabee and, and, and Shimon Bar Kosiba, uh, I do use Jesus as uh, a sort of historical point of reference, because like these other characters, and there's several others, I mean, I, I talk about uh, Zerubbabel, the, the governor of Persia, um, you know, from, from Ezra Nehemiah, uh, and, uh, well, the Hasmoneans, and Herod the Great also gets a lot of attention in the book, um, mm-hmm. Jesus, uh, Bar Kokhba, uh, the rabbinic, well, uh, Rabbi Judah, the patriarch, is the, the first uh, Jewish patriarch in, in the land of Israel, and then his counterparts in Babylonia. Um, there, there are a number of these figures, and because it's a, uh, you know, a sort of ancient Judaism and Christianity type book, I take Jesus as one example among a number of the phenomena sure. I'm, I'm interested in here. But yeah. I, but in that, his, I mean, certain historical givens about him, I think, do matter. So I certainly don't do, you know, sort of any sort of extended historical Jesus Mm -hmm. reconstruction. But but I do think, and I I think more so actually having written this book, um, that the way the texts that I'm studying work, it's it's very much, you know, an engagement with, they're engaging with scripture and, uh, you know, earlier traditions, traditions antecedent to them. 
but always with reference to their own contemporary circumstances. And for texts that are partisan to particular persons, you know, those circumstances mean the the quote unquote facts about the life of those people as far as the authors know them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I came into the book, for example, um, not having a strong opinion or sort of uh, about this question of, you know, whether Jesus uh, actually had a claim to Davidic descent or not, because, you know, it's a really common in critical gospel scholarship in the modern period and in some uh, sort of Jewish studies scholarship on Messianism to say, oh, yeah, anyone who was thought to be a Messiah had a Davidic ancestry manufactured for him, right? Mm-hmm. So the fact that the Gospels say Jesus was a Davidite doesn't tell us anything uh, historical, um, which there's something to that line of argument. Although one of the things I discovered is uh, that there's actually there's a number of ancient messiahs who didn't have and therefore no one made a claim of Davidic ancestry for them. So actually mm-hmm. I thought, you know what, it's not the case that anyone who's thought to be a messiah would have a, you know, a, an ersatz genealogy written up um, for him because... King Herod didn't, and uh, Bar Kokhba didn't, and so on and so on. So, yeah. um, so I did. I, I did find myself actually bumping up against and making a few cautious claims about, um, you know, a few data about uh, the life of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, as to, I mean, how would the book be different? I mean, if I had devoted more attention to the case of Jesus and especially the historical Jesus, right, questions about historical facts so far as we can reconstruct them of his of his life, it would have just changed the shape of the book a great deal in that I, in a way I didn't, I don't, I didn't and wouldn't want it to go in that f- because I want to, uh, I mean, one of the one of the angles this book's take this book takes is trying to reclaim early Christian evidence as you know useful for reading alongside uh, the bigger picture of ancient Jewish uh, evidence, and mm-hmm. and because of the dogma that's come down to us about the distinction between the Jewish Messiah and the Christian Messiah, that's systematically not done in older books, right? Um, mm-hmm. The idea is the Christian Messiah is just something else entirely, and. In the way I'm looking about messianism, I want to argue it's just not, and so I needed to take Jesus uh, as a uh, an, a wonderfully well attested uh, example, but an example along with uh, Herod and Bar Kokhba and Rabbi Judah the Patriarch and so on. Um, so I, you know, I've had some discussions with um, friends, very smart New Testament scholars, you know, who said I wanted some more New Testament uh, in here. Uh, which I think there there are interesting things one could go on and say now about New Testament texts, but it was important to me that it that it not be uh, that the New Testament not eat up too much of this book. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me, I guess part of it is uh, is that there's a ton of value in in uh, the sort of larger uh, approach that I think was very necessary. And I'm glad you, you you did the project the way that you did it. But also for me, I can't help but think that Jesus, you know, the historical Jesus himself is. Uh, entering into this language game, quite possibly. I mean, we have portrayals of him doing such. You know, and for me, the the question of uh, the way in which he's entering into that game as a historical person um, is very interesting to me to think about how that relates to his own messianic conceptions, how those might have been generated through his own scriptural engagements uh, and whatnot. So I I, I, uh, I hear you on the one hand, but on the other hand, I guess I, I also line up with saying, hey, I, I, would, I would like more in that direction. Yeah. But, you know, you, you know, you've written just two books on, you know, Messiah language. Uh, you know, you could obviously write a third or a fourth. Um, you know, and uh, do you have any plans in that direction? Are you, what is what is uh, any <laughs> you going to tip your hand at all in terms of your future research agenda? Yeah, I, I, I don't have in mind to write a, another book on messianism. Uh, for, for now, I think I've said what I have to say uh, about it. I you know I in the first book I very briefly sketched a direction I thought it should go, and then I went on to you know one, say something about Paul, Pauline Christology. In this book, I basically said what I think uh, needs saying by way of intervention in this uh, area of research. I, I I mean, as you'll know, I try to set it up and the end of the book, you know, leans into this that um, while I treat a whole lot of texts here and I, I try to give a pretty programmatic statement of what I think is going on, I do it in such a way as I hope it's very much, it's not a last word uh, on the topic I mean, it may be my last word on the topic. I don't know, but it's 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 not meant to be the you know sort of definitive all there is to say about messianism. Rather, it's meant to set up 
possibilities uh, for research, you know, for the, to, to say we've, we've looked at this body of text from just one angle for so long uh, that it, we sort of had blinders on. There's lots of really fascinating stuff here that has just been systematically screened out by virtue of the prevailing method used. And mm -hmm. so I try to uh, tee up not myself necessarily, but others to, to sort of be free to ask different kinds of questions of um, these these ancient uh, Messiah texts. And, you know, in, in a nascent way, I've, I've seen a number of projects like this uh, that others are doing that I'm excited about. I mean, uh, some of my own students at Edinburgh uh, and other people I've met through, you know, SBL and conference circles who uh, are, are hopefully will be able to use some of these ideas to, to do some really creative new stuff in the New Testament uh, and in some of the rabbinic texts and elsewhere. So for my part, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working presently on uh, something on, on Pauline theology. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking elsewhere than Messianism at the present. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I, and I do think, especially for those who of listeners who might be, a, you know, on a more research track, uh, I do think in the, in the final chapter, you did do a nice job of, of laying out uh, a research agenda for other people to follow. And so that's very helpful. Um, all right, uh, last thought from you then. Um, what's the Messiah book you'd most recommend to us, apart from your own, of course? If, uh, if you're going to recommend to our audience just one uh, book on uh, the topic of Messiah, what's that one book? Ooh, that's tough. The one, if it could only be one, I'd probably say John Collins, The Scepter and the Star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, that, that's an excellent, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a number of honorable mentions. I actually ticked some of them off in the last chapter, but uh, Hugo Gressman, Der Messias. Uh, hey, you're... Hey, you're cheating. I, I know, I know. Well, they're honorable mention. They're not the one. Collins is the only one, I think. Okay. Um, but, I mean, yeah, mo many of your readers will know that book. Uh, and it, it yeah. really is for, um, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the best uh, book I know of, of, of uh, that, that, that sort of does the, the sort of uh, history of, uh, I mean, Collins is actually pretty cautious in this. It's not, a, it's not a messianic idea book as such, but it's generally conventional in its outline. Um, yeah. But it's recent, pretty exhaustive, and it does that job better than, than just about any I know. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair choice. I mean, you're, you've read in the field much more than I have on this topic, but uh, that would have been mine as well, I think. Um, well, Matt, it's been, it's been great to catch up with you and talk about your book, uh, The Grammar of Messianism. Uh, really terrific. I learned a lot from it, uh, and I, I think you've managed to sharpen certainly my own messianic grammar and undoubtedly those of our listeners as well, so we've appreciated it. Well, thanks very much, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is your host, Matthew Bates, for On Script. Our guest for today has been Matthew Novenson, and we've been speaking about his book, The Grammar of Messianism, published by Oxford University Press in 2017. There's a link to the book on our website, onscript.study. Wishing peace and good to all of our listeners. Until next time. Thanks for staying tuned, folks. Here are a few book recommendations from you, the listeners. First of all, from Michael Spallion, if I got that correct, apologies if I mispronounced your name, uh, he re recommends the author Michelle Lee Barnwall, especially her latest book, Neither Complementarian Nor Egalitarian. Peter Steigerwald, I'm giving, I don't know why I'm using a German pronunciation because it's a German name. Anyway, he says that for his wife Sarah, it's uh, John Walton's Lost World of Genesis 1. And for him, that's for Peter, at the moment he says, and, and he swears he's not pandering to uh, to Matt Bates, the co-host here at OnScript, but it's Salvation by Allegiance Alone by Matt Bates, who I can I, I can just see him blushing, um, even though he's not next to me right now. Uh, he said his sermon uh, that Sunday on Ephesians 1 wouldn't look anything like it does without Matt's book. Uh, Christopher Scott says one book that I've been reading recently is A Dispensational Biblical Theology by Dr. Elliot Johnson at Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, he said I found this book to to be a great modern summary of dispensationalism and it's useful for helping him understand the different sections of the Bible. Um, and Chris, I was raised on dispensational thought, so I know it well. Um, even though I no longer subscribe to that, but I you know I still remember learning definition of dispensationalism as a distinguishable what is it, a, a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's purposes. Um, 
anyway, I didn't know, I didn't know that there were dispensational books being written now. So there you go if you're, uh, if that's your, um, gig. And, uh, thanks for that recommendation, Chris. And those are, uh, a few from you. So keep them coming. You can send your recommendations to onscriptpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks, y'all. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.